everybody, and welcome to episode 14 of Ask the CEO with me, your host, Abraham Gatai. Today is a very special episode because we have a very special guest, one of the top names in the Jewish music industry. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome the one and only Benny Friedman. Welcome. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing phenomenal. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. So, so I know you've been very busy um, with the launch of your new album, Fill the World with Light. How is that going? Fantastic. Thank God. We can't complain. Um, the CD has uh, we released it about, uh, I'd say, almost two weeks ago. And... Uh, People have uh, a good reaction to it. People are, I think they're enjoying it. At least that's what they're telling me. <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience, uh, I really enjoyed it. In fact, I, I run every day on the treadmill and I've moved that up to the top of my uh, treadmill nice. music track. I, I, hear, I hear that a lot. People say, I run with your music. <laughs> I, bike, I bike every day with the music. It's on my treadmill. It's on my bike. I, uh, it keeps you going. Absolutely. I like it. Good. Get moving. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about the album, Fill, uh, Fill the World with Light. Um, you know, it starts off with the blockbuster song composed by Ari Goldwag, Ivri uh, Onaychi, um, I'm a Jew, I'm proud yes. to be a Jew. Tell me a little bit about the inspiration, because this is such an amazing song. I'm curious to hear how that came about. Um, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a culmination of a long collection of, of, of events or thoughts or things like that. Um, when I was just starting out in the music business, I got my hands on a particular song that I thought was really, really nice. And I played it for my father. And my father listened to it for about 20 seconds. And he said, come on, Benny, you're too young to sing songs like this. <laughs> the song is too sad. You're young. You're supposed to be full of optimism. Mm. You can, you know, young people can change the whole world. We can, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no room for, for melancholy in, a, in someone who's, who's 20, 22, I don't remember how old I was. And so I definitely took those words to heart and, and tried to focus very strong on songs that are filled with young energy as far as being hopeful about the future, being, uh, being very uh, proud of where we are and where we're holding. Um, and... So it, 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 it brought us Yesh Tikva, it brought us Toda, it brought us Tam, Uru, Kitoi Vashem, and on and on and on. And then, of course, when Ari sent me this song, Ivri Anoichi, which is basically a Jewish pride anthem. Right. And so I, it, was, it took two seconds to realize that this song has huge potential. And uh, with some original lyrics from Miriam Israeli, in Hebrew and Shmuel Marcus in English, and some fantastic uh, musical arrangements by Daniel Kapler and Jan Freider. I mean, it just came together very, very uh, perfectly, I think. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely um, will become one of the top uh, songs of this year, for sure. Be'ezrat Hashem. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, besides for being a top song, which is of course what we hope for in, in, as, as business people, but I think also as, as a message for young Jewish people. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at the uh, Yom NCSY in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, and, uh, and they were playing these great anthems, you know, by, by, uh, by uh, artists like Matis and things like that. And I just thought to myself, it's, it's so useful and so perfect to have a song that a young Jewish person who's growing up in today's world can, can turn to and get some, a little inspiration from us, you know, just give a little Jewish pride, add a little Jewish pride into his life where he can walk around the streets around him among his friends, among the people he comes in contact with and not be ashamed, God forbid, and not be embarrassed and not try to hide the fact that he is God's chosen child. That is, that is a beautiful message. I, I agree. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. 
You know, so this is a perfect segue into, into the next song because it's talking about the Jewish pride. And the song Al Tishlach, which is the second song, it, uh, it gives you the feeling, you know, this is, this is uh, it, it, it brings up emotions of the origins of uh, the Jewish nation. Al Tishlach Yatcha, um, was, uh, was, was this done on purpose where you made that the second song or how did, how did that come about? Well, I'll tell you a little secret about my process, the way we put together these records. A lot of it, um, after the fact, we could read into things <laughs> that we never intended. Right. The truth is, the song was definitely uh, arranged and produced in a way to make it sound like, you know, starting out in the desert with Avram Avinu talking to God for the first time. Um, that was for sure. The fact that it followed Ivri and Oichi was a, just a, a happy accident. Um, but um, the song Ivri, the song Al Tishlach uh, Yodcha, I, I, again, this was a song that it came to me um, full, complete, with all the lyrics, with the tune, basically with the arrangement. Um, not all the ethnic sounds, but <laughs> but uh, the song was complete and I heard it and again in two seconds I said this I gotta sing the song yeah, because for me um, this question with the story with Avram Avinu God telling him to sacrifice his son and then coming in at the last minute and saving him yeah. this story is a story that we refer back to all the time in prayer on Rosh Hashanah again and again and again it's a major central theme in, 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 in uh, Judaism and, and uh, they even tell us that this is where the Jewish people have gotten their ability to, for self-sacrifice, for Mesir as Nefesh. comes from this uh, act that Avram Avinu was prepared and ready to sacrifice his son. And then Hashem steps in at the last minute and saves the, saves the, saves the child. And it always bothered me that for, okay, that was the first time. And then after that, for two, 3,000 years, Jewish people have been asked, Jewish fathers, Jewish mothers have been asked to give up their children, al Kiddush Hashem. And there was no step in at the last minute. And they lost their children. And, uh, and the song basically begs Hashem to come in and step in at the last minute and say, al Tishlach why, 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 uh, why are we dealing with this? Uh, oh. <laughs> Speaking about fathers and children... Is my son David? That was like an hello. It's like hi, David. Hi. Just getting some lunch. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so a little product placement. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah. Back to the song. Um, there's definitely a feeling there that the Jewish people have been feeling for the last 2,000 years where it's just enough already. We ask our Father in Heaven. You know that, uh, you know, I mean, Avram proved to you 3,000 years ago that we, are, that we are ready to do this. We don't need tests anymore. Yeah. We don't need to test us. We passed the test. You know we're loyal. We know we're, we, you know we're your only child. And ready to do whatever it takes to make you happy. Enough with the tests. Al tishlach yodcha. Stop. Uh... Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So then, um, yeah. So then let's let's move on to the next song. Uh, so the next song, Ashir El Hashem. It follows. It's a more of an up uh, an upbeat tune. Um, so what what was the inspiration behind that? The inspiration behind that song is very simple. It's a, it's a great song. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, it's easy. It's light. And following a heavy song like Al Tish Lach Yodcha, I thought it was nice, uh, a nice change of energy, a little bit of a pickup from uh, something that could be a very emotionally uh, heavy song to something a little lighter and a little happier. And Ashir Lashem, I think, is just a nice, fun, happy song. And uh, that's what we're all about. Agreed, agreed. Um, I have to tell you, uh, the fourth song, Rabbi Shulamer, you know, 
as an entrepreneur, okay, we hear all the time how you need to hustle and you need to move. And so, you know, that song truly resonated with me. <laughs> so that song is, is, is by far the most, uh, <coughs> the most special and the most personal song for me that I've ever recorded. Um, it opens up with my uncle talking, my uncle's voice. My uncle is uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Yamin Gordon of blessed memory, the head shliach in the valley in California. And um, the words of the chorus, the medets, are words that he heard right uh, at the beginning of his shlichus when he went out uh, for, for, uh, to start Chabad in the valley. The Rebbe told him the main thing, the most important thing is to decide, to resolve, to work, be with alacrity, wake up early in the morning and work hard and pound the pavement and don't sleep in and don't krecht and don't turn over and say, I'm too lazy today. And second of all, be in chazak, with tremendous faith uh, and trust that there is uh, somebody running the world in, in uh, watching and seeing everything that you do and how it turns out and just have complete faith that so long as I put in the work, God takes care of the rest. And when he heard those words, um, he made those words his life's motto. And as he became more and more uh, of a mentor and someone that people turn to for advice and help, um, those were always the words that he told them. In fact, we were in the studio in New Jersey, recording the song, and a rabbi, a shliach, from the local area, came in to stop, and he stops in every once in a while to say hello to the uh, engineer there. And we're, I'm recording those words, and he goes, what is he singing? <laughs> he says, I can't believe it. He pulls out his wallet, and he has a little handwritten note in there, because many years ago, he needed some, some advice and some guidance, and he called... Rabbi Gordon in California, and Rabbi Gordon told him those words, and he wrote them down in his wallet, and he had them with him all the time. So this was, uh, these were words that he always told people, rabbis, shluchim, business people, lay leaders, bachrim, whatever it was, anybody in any stage in life. This is the recipe, like he says at the end of the song, these are the magic words for success in life. Yeah. Wake up. And he says the words in his interview, he says, hustle, yustle, move on muscle. So we, of course, incorporated that into the song. You got to hustle. You can't sleep in. You can't uh, hit the snooze button. You got to work hard and trust that uh, God will take care of the, of the details as far as results. Yeah, um, that's an amazing story, by the way. And, and, you know, that's something, uh, again, as, as entrepreneurs and just people that are, are, are working all day and, you know, we're living in tough times. And, you know, those are the two things for success that you have to put in the work, you have to put in the effort, but at the same time, you have to have the faith, you have to trust that it's in God's hands. You just need to do the effort. You need to put in the effort, but the results, those aren't yours and you don't need to worry about it. That'll happen. Exactly. In fact, I heard a story of the Baal Shem Tov, which, right, or, you, know, you can't believe every story, but, uh, you know, it could have happened, certainly. I heard a story where the Baal Shem Tov needed to raise money for a certain uh, project or whatever it was, and he went to a wealthy man's house, and he knocked on the door, and, and, he, and he left. So the uh, businessman, the wealthy man, ran after him. He said, Rabbi, where are you going? He says, uh, I, need, I need to collect money. So why would you just knock on the door and leave? So the Baal Shem Tov said, because I did my part. <laughs> I did my part, and I got to take care of the rest. I went, I knocked, and then that's it. So we just have to do our part. Anias, Shalia, Sisi, we got to make sure we take care of that part. I got to make sure that I do mine. Yeah. My, my uh, part of the deal, and trust and have faith that God will take care of everything that's not in, in my lane, you know? Yeah, that, very, very nicely said. Um, and okay, so then that takes us to uh, that segues us into uh, the theme of the album, "Fill the World with Light," which which is a beautiful message. Um, how did that come about? 
most of the songs, the way they, the way they evolve is that we're sent a song and either it's totally complete, like uh, in the case of Al Tishlach Yodcha, or it's uh, the beginnings of an idea, like Ivri Anaychi, or the idea is there, but the, the, the project needs a little bit of completion, or like, also in this case, Fill the World with Light was originally uh, a Hebrew lyric, uh, uh, like a, a song with uh, lyrics from the prayer, from the davening, and uh, it's a beautiful tune, a beautiful uh, chorus, and I felt like like uh, it has the, a power to be a beautiful prayer. And the song itself is basically um, thanking God for everything that we have and asking for just a little bit more. We thank God for our family, for our friends, for the people in our lives. And we ask uh, God for that extra little blessing that, you know, we as a, as a people, we all get along. We all love each other. We'll go to the ends of the earth for one another. And uh, the, the, uh, the promise that we are promised from God is that when we are together, when we have uh, then the blessings come. So we're asking, we're trying to cash in. Yeah. We love each other. We're happy. We're, we, are, we are one family. All right, we argue once in a while. So what, which family doesn't? That, that, that's family, right. Yeah, that's a family. That's what a family is. We're not a family picture. We're a real family. <laughs> and, uh, and we're asking for those prayers. Give us life. Give us peace. Give us health. Give us strength. And fill the world with light. Give us Mashiach. We're doing what we can to fill the world with light every day, every minute. And, um, and we want Hashem to do, uh, you know, to, to, to do His part the way He can, to fill the world with the infinite light of godliness the way only He can. Nice, nice. So, so then what that takes us to uh, Besefer Chaim, also a nice, uh, a nice upbeat tune. Um, so what, uh, what was behind that song? Besefer Chaim is, uh, is an upbeat prayer for Rosh Hashanah. You know, a lot of people associate Rosh Hashanah with, with you know, biting your nails and the, the king sitting on his throne and he's judging you and if you didn't behave, you're gone, you know, it's, and it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, nerves. And uh, the truth is that Rosh Hashanah is meant to be viewed, uh, viewed uh, as a happy time. Why? Because Rosh Hashanah, the message of Rosh Hashanah basically is, like the message in the Bitochin Chazak of uh, track number four, the message of Rosh Hashanah is that this world is not random. The world is not accidents. The world is not um, subatomic particles colliding with each other and creating uh, things that just uh, kind of happen. The world is run by, uh, by an Abishter by a God, by the creator of the world, who sits in his, in his uh, control tower and decides and, 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 and judges and knows every detail in the world, what will be, how it will be, when it will be, with every detail. And knowing this should be so comforting and should give a person such joy and happiness to know that the, the king of the master of all the worlds, right? The, 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 this vast universe, which is just a small, a small detail in, in God's existence, if you can call it that. And yet he busies himself with the minutia, the details in my life how and where and when and who and how long and how much and this knowledge that he loves me and cares about me and 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 bothers it bothers himself to, to to worry about my schedule and my life and the details that happen around me is such a is such a relief it gives me such such uh it takes a load off my shoulders and the, the knowledge that everything will be good because the good king is running the world 
makes me want to dance. Yeah, this is so different from the old school of fear and trepidation of it's so hard to be a Jew. It's so hard to do everything, uh, everything we're supposed to do. Or we look, at, we look at our commandments as things that you cannot do as opposed to this is a privilege. It's an honor. And like you said, it, it's the faith that God is looking over all aspects of our lives. And, you know, I, I, once, saw, I once saw a documentary that showed – um, it, it, it zoomed, it zoomed in on a person, then it zoomed out and it started, um, going up into space and it showed the earth and then it showed the solar system and then it zoomed out to the galaxy and multiple galaxies in the universe. And then it zoomed in again, you know, at high speed. And you see like, you, you see the entire cosmos just zooming in, it goes back to the person, to the person, you know, like inside the person, and you see, you know, blood vessels and everything down to the atom level. And that's the faith that uh, we need to have, that God created all this, and he's, he, he's, he's still busying himself with our lives. So that's a re really beautiful right. and powerful message. Yep. For sure. Um, and and uh, the same thing. Is that that the the, the deep like I, I remember I was at a Farbringen and the rabbi was saying how he loves flying in airplanes. He's an older man because he gets to sit at the window and see the whole world look this small. And what he likes to do is he has the whole world in his in his in his vision and he likes to do this <laughs> because you sit on a plane and you realize the whole world is so small. And yet, when you're on Earth, when you're on the ground, everything seems so big and so important. And really, like you said, there's a huge universe, and uh, and uh, we can't take ourselves so seriously. Right, right. Really, very nicely said. Yeah. So, so, so let's move on. Uh, so the next song, Malayich. It, it brings back this nostalgic feeling of uh, Avram Fried in the 1990s, the mid-90s. Uh, um, uh, that's, uh, that's the feeling that I got when I first heard that song. Um, just curious uh, if that was intentional or... Interesting, yes, because that is the first song that I, I got the opportunity to record that was composed by Yossi Green. Mm. And, you know Yossi Green... And Avram Fried, it was their collaborations. It was most, mostly his compositions that Avram Fried was singing in the 90s. So uh, it, was a nice, uh, it was a nice opportunity for me. That song, both Meloich and Es Tzemach David, two Yossi Green compositions that really uh, brought me back, at least, to, uh, to when I was growing up, what Jewish music sounded like then. Yeah. Just a nice, gishmake, prayerful, uh, modern Jewish music that Yossi Green is so is so he's famous you know, he's boss yeah and uh, okay so 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 that follows up with Kulam Sharim a nice upbeat happy tune I, I actually love that song as well uh, another one of my favorites um, so was that another um, follow following a more uh, uh, serious song yeah, we try not to let the mood stay too serious for too long. Um, Kulam Sharim is another, it's another uh, song where the theme basically is that uh, we do our job. Um, and the only way to do it is through simcha, through faith. Adam lo shar shira ela mitoch simcha. The only way to get the job done is through joy and happiness and positivity and uh and that's what we try to focus on and again when we see the blessings in our lives and we know that it's coming from the master of the world and that he uh he takes an interest how can you not dance how can it not make how can it not fill your heart with joy and uh, and positive thoughts because i mean this is this is better than winning the lottery yes so that follows the song, um, the words from Tanakh, Al Yishalel. What was the message in that song? 
the message in that song is, is, uh, is basically like this. The song was written by a man named Reb Shlomo Yehuda Rechnitz, who is uh, a very, very well-known um, Jewish businessman out in Los Angeles, a very big philanthropist, um, a well-known composer. Um, you might even say a well-known wealthy guy. And, and, and he wrote it, um, took the words from Tanakh, and he, he was just explaining to me how those words are so personal to him. Why? Because the words mean basically, a, a wise man or a genius or an intellectual shouldn't hold himself higher than anybody else because he's so smart. Right. right. Don't uh, don't give yourself the credit because you're so smart. Don't think you're a hotshot. And Alisal Gibar Big a strong man, shouldn't uh, glorify himself through his through his strength or with his strength. And an, a wealthy man shouldn't with his money. What he, a wealthy man. Says Shlomo Yehuda Rechnitz to me. He says when it says the Ashir, the wealthy man, he's not talking about people. Don't think that a wealthy. Guy, he's talking to the wealthy man himself. It's talking to me. The pasuk, the verse, is saying to the wealthy man, "Don't be impressed with your wealth. Don't be impressed with your with your with your intellectual capabilities. Don't be impressed. Don't 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 let yourself be impressed with your own with your own gifts." Because they're not yours, they are gifts. Kiim yeah. Bezois, yeah. the one thing you can, you can uh, glorify is the fact that God Almighty, God in heaven, sat upon his throne and judged you worthy of having these gifts. God Almighty gave you these gifts out of his kindness. This you can glorify. All this money that you see around here, all this, uh, all this genius ideas that I'm spewing forth, all this strength that you see, the way I can pick up this whole house, these are all small manifestations of God's greatness. Very nice. nice. And, and, you know, the, the truth is, and it's pretty much any, any quality that you have. Uh, you know, like I said, if you're smart, if you have a good idea, if you have this great business idea um, and you're – you're immensely successful. Um, where did that idea come from? So it's, it's so important to, to remember that. Yep. And then that takes us to the final song, Call You May Chayai, the finale of the album. Um, so what's the message of that song? The message in that song is the, is the, the, the roundup, the sachakal, the bottom line of all of this is that when I recognize and see that God is so good to me and God is so good to, to, uh, to those around me, then it's my job to A, be so good to him and to live every day, every moment, uh, trying to be like him. Um, and how do I be like him? He is called Hatoy Vahametiv. He is good and he does goodness. He's good and he does good things. So I have to make sure that I do good, do right by him. And, of course, do good for the people around me. To try to emulate him. Every day, to try to be... Um, to recognize the goodness that he does for me and to try to repay it, both paying it back to him and paying it forward to the people that I come in contact with. This is the thing that makes this album so special is that it's not just a collection of songs and words. There's so much heart that went into this and that, and that message, that language of the heart, that's what comes through in this album. And I'm so, I'm so happy, I'm so thankful that I had an opportunity to speak with you about this and for you to share your message with the world. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll definitely have to do this again.
Yes, yes. So, so, so Benny, um, having gone through this amazing uh, work of yours, how did you get started with all this? How did you get started in the, in the music industry and in your business? Well, it, it's very difficult, that's for sure. Um, I think step number one is that you have to be determined. Um, for example, I knew that this was it for me. I didn't have any other options. This is where I'm going to be, and, uh, and that's the end of the story. And uh, whether I will be successful at it and whether I will not be successful at it are, are small details. But this is where I'm going to be. I will be singing. I will be in, involved in music. And, uh, you know, I heard once a very famous comedian talking about his own life, school teacher, a public school teacher. He told his father he wanted to become a comedian. And his father said, oh, it's a tough business. You're going to have to be ready for a lot of disappointment. So he says, I said to my father, how much do you make a year? $35,000? If I am destined to make in my life $35,000 a year, I would rather make that money doing comedy. Wow. So as my father told me, with that attitude, you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. But the first step, I think, is to be determined. This, this is what I need to do. This is, this is my whole soul. This is my whole life. This is where I am happy, and this is where I feel I am the most useful. So anything else is not an option. That's step number one. Step number two is how all the details have to fall into place. Right. But step number one is to decide, aze unit andesh, like this and, and, and nothing else. And then, of course, uh, having good friends, good connections, people to throw in a good word for you to people uh, who can make things happen. And, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, to, to construct it backwards and, and say, this is how to do it. This is how it worked out for me. There was a man named Dizzy Taubenfeld of blessed memory, who was uh, the owner of Sameach Music, a music production company in uh, Brooklyn. And, uh, and he contacted me and basically offered to invest 100% in my first record, which is something that is unheard of. So that was uh, the first step and the biggest step, I mean, that's the hardest part for, for most singers who are starting out is how do, how do I, how do I... <laughs> how do you produce the first one? Yeah, it's extremely expensive. You have to know people. You have to be, you have to have, be in touch with professionals. It's holy, holy, on and on. So many pieces have to come together. And it's the most, uh, most difficult uh, thing. And here was a man who has all the connections and had the investment sitting. And he just handed it to me on a, on a, on a, on a silver platter and said, here you go. So that is definitely, again, that's, that's where the Bitochim Chazak comes in. There's nothing I did for that. I didn't deserve it. He just gave it to me. Like a gift from heaven. Um, so uh, that was the first, uh, the first big break. And I mean, obviously, it didn't happen out of nowhere. It didn't come out of the blue. It came because for, for, for four or five years prior, I was getting on every stage I had the opportunity to. I would, I would, I would you know, never turn down an opportunity to sing. Um, I was studying voice very, very diligently. I was working on my uh, singing, working on my craft, trying to get better. Um, I insisted, and, and to my parents' credit, my parents insisted. My parents are not wealthy people, and they uh, bankrolled my, my voice lessons, and they insisted that I not go to just anybody. I should find the best. And uh, sometimes the best is also more expensive. And they said, you got to do what you got to do. And I studied voice with a guy named Seth Riggs in Los Angeles, who was one of the uh, world class, world famous voice teachers who, who, uh, who literally changed my, my voice, um, gave me my voice basically before I, before I started studying with him with a joke. And uh, so I was working very hard, traveling, 
trying to get every job, working for nothing, coast to coast. I didn't have anywhere. I wasn't living in any set place. It wasn't a me. It wasn't me who shot. You know, there was no, uh, it, was, it was a lot of... It wasn't easy. It wasn't settled. Well, it, yeah. it was not settled. Right. There was no guaranteed future. And it was just, it was just try and, and, and try, try to get it done. And uh, I did one job in Chicago, I think it was, and a, somebody recorded it and the recording went around and it was nostalgia like that. It kind of snowballed. This one contacted me, that one contacted me and make a deal, a 50%, a 70%. I'll own you for four years. I'll own you for 10 years. And then finally came along Izzy Taubenfeld and said, no strings attached. I'll make an album. I'll own the album. He said, that's, I mean, an investment. But uh, we'll produce it for you. 100% uh, free and clear. No 10-year uh, no obligation. And uh, that is something that, that I'm, first of all, I'm forever grateful for. And, uh, and it's difficult when... when People, uh, you know, aspiring singers come and say, so how, how do I get into the business? And I say, you need, you need somebody like Izzy Talmanfeld to offer you a $150,000 investment for, for no return. Um, it's very difficult. But that was the first step. And uh, after that, um, Mendy Werdiger from Adaret Music uh, offered to, to uh, invest in the second album, which turned out to be Esh Tikva, which turned out to be an unbelievable success. Yeah. And uh, thank God that was ready. I had, I had uh, you know, my feet on the ground. And since then, it's just try to establish a certain, a certain energy, a certain, I don't know if you call it branding in business, you might call it branding, but right. it's a certain, a certain personality to this music um, that is, uh, that is uh, offering something maybe new and different. Yeah. You know, what you say is basically what every successful person goes through where you make a decision and you have a commitment and it's not going to be glory right from the start. You're going to go through rough periods, but because you have a goal, you have that vision and you see it through, you get results and that's, and that's where you took it. And, and, and it might not be glory at the end either. <laughs> well, something, okay, with social media the way it works is people say you can't you can't judge your your day-to-day -day life against somebody else's uh, social media life right you can't right compare your life against their they call it their their highlight reel or their uh, you know whatever and the truth is that it, it it opens up your eyes to the way the whole world works because because the whole world is marketing Right, you have these big celebrities or these big, very successful entrepreneurs and all the good stuff and all the, the successful people in the world. But the part that you get to see from them, I, the part that you get to see from them is the part more by and large, the part that they want you to see. Yeah. Right. It's their it's their marketing. So you don't see so their struggles and what goes on in their behind. Right. This part you don't see. You don't see them, uh, you know, with their stomach aches and with their headaches and with their, uh, with their, uh, you know what I mean? On and on and on. I don't want to get too graphic with, with the examples of problems people could have. You know, uh, you know people can have, uh, big celebrities can have athlete's foot too. You know what I mean? <laughs> but they don't, they don't share that with the rest of the world. Right. They share the way they're looking perfect and, uh, you know, and million dollar production teams and, uh, and, uh, post-production and pre-production and on and on and on. And you can't compare yourself even as an entrepreneur, even as a businessman, you're sitting in your office, schwitzing, trying to get through a difficult phone call or whatever it is. And you're just thinking to yourself, man, oh man, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates never has to do this. Right. It's not true. Bill Gates just never shares that part of his life with you. So uh, whatever you mean, life is real, and uh, and David can tell you this, right? Life is real, right? Oh, suddenly he got shy. <laughs> He's on the spotlight. Yeah, he's not used to that. Um. So, Benny, what were some of the ups and downs you experienced as you were building your? <laughs> 
um, very early on, when, when, uh, when my first uh, CD came out, when my first CD came out, uh, which came, it came with a lot of excitement, um, and I got very busy. I was suddenly getting tons of phone calls and uh, working very hard, getting a lot of jobs. And uh, that lasted for about one year. And then just everything dried up. And uh, I remember, why are you so excited? I remember I, I, my, my, the, the mailbox in my apartment uh, building, my mailbox, the, the key uh, jammed, whatever it was, I, could, I needed to replace the lock on my, uh, <coughs> on my mailbox. W, are you okay? Yeah. I needed to replace the lock on my mailbox okay. and I didn't have the $20 to okay. buy a new lock. I went to my cousin and okay. I asked him to, to borrow $20. Um, it, was, it was very difficult. And, uh, you know, it, it comes, you know, you, you, you stay up at night wondering if, uh, if you've made a terrible mistake and if you have to just man up and realize that uh, maybe you need to go get yourself a job. You know what I mean? You're a husband, you're a father, and uh, this is just irresponsible. You know, uh, your wife tells you we got bills to pay and you say, yeah, but uh, you know what I mean? Uh, business is like, and she, she tells you, hello, I'm not asking you for excuses. I'm telling you we have bills to pay, <laughs> right? Not in those words, but I mean, that's the, uh, that's the reality of it. I'm working, I'm trying or working. I make a phone call. He's calling me back. He hasn't called me back. It's his fault. It's my fault. Hello, who's responsible for this family? And, uh, and that was a big struggle that I had. Maybe it's time to, uh, to face reality, you know, uh, struggling artist is uh, a very romantic sounding thing, but uh, it don't pay the bills. Um, but I, like, I mean, I just refuse to accept it, which may have been silly and foolhardy, and maybe it doesn't come highly recommended for, uh, for everybody, and maybe it should be a disclaimer, don't try this at home. Um, I, I just, I didn't, I, I, I refused to recognize that that might be a possibility, even though it kept me up at night. And, uh, and uh, three years or two years after the jobs basically dried up, I had a, you know, we had a song called Yesh Tikva come out on, uh, on our second record. And uh, even after Yesh Tikva, I said, you know, Yesh Tikva is the, you know, the ticket, you know, and for months after Yesh Tikva came out, nothing, nothing, no, no, no change in the status. Wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And it was, it was very, very frightening. And then I would say about three months or four months after Yesh Tikva came out, um, it suddenly blew up. It suddenly blew up and suddenly everybody was talking about it. There were write-ups about it. In, in magazines and and articles and phone calls just started flooding in. It was crazy. And uh, I mean, since then, obviously, there's ups and downs. It's, uh, it's a wave. Life is not uh, static. But uh, thank God, I can't complain. Yeah, so that, I mean, you, you know, so what, what you were basically saying, this is something that every, every, business person that's ever been successful at, at growing their business will always talk about, like you said, this is the parts that people don't see, the struggles, the, the failures. And I mean, I could certainly appreciate where you've been. Uh, many of us that are running their own business have been there. And it, it goes back to what you started with saying that you made a decision. That was your decision. You don't see any other way out and you carried it through. And um, I think with the with with Yesh Tikva, it probably just took a while for it to filter through everybody's brains, uh, because right. yeah, I mean, I, I I couldn't believe it that 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 didn't do it because that's that's how I found out about you. <laughs> it was that song. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. We were sitting in the in the studio with my uh, producers, and I, I turned to Avi Newmark who produced that song. And I said, we were just working on it, listening to it, to, you know, one of the final mixes. 
And I said to him, man, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will. And then it didn't do it. <laughs> right? right? It was months uh, waiting and waiting and waiting. Oh, I have this huge song. I mean, we didn't know how huge it was going to be. But I have this song that's basically, uh, you know, uh, that's my best work, man. I can't do better than that. And, uh, and nothing. Uh, but, uh, but then. <laughs> then, thank yeah, God. God. What kept you going during those few months um, waiting af after Yesh Tikva? Uh, nothing it was the same it was the same thing that that i was feeling for for about a year before it was i'm i'm gonna have to do something i'm gonna have to make a move um what kind of move i don't know but i'm gonna have to make a move yeah i mean i wasn't sure what the move was going to be um but some, something had to, something was going to give Either, 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 you know what I mean? Either I was going to start making money in music or I was going to have to uh, be an adult and uh, do something because the way it was going was just not, not sustainable. Um, but thank God, before I could do anything rash, they wish to get hold of And, uh, and just got picked up. Um, since then, I've put out um, three CDs, one a Shabbos collection, one Kol uh, Neshama Sheli, With All My Soul, and this latest one, uh, Fill the World with Light. And thank God, uh, they've been getting good responses. We have good numbers and sales. And, uh, and I've been traveling the world and uh, trying to do, uh, you know, my part in the, you know, Ma'at Oir, Try to add a little bit of light. A little, little bit of light to push away the darkness. You say a little light pushes away a lot of darkness. So all you got to do is give a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Benny, this is, this is great. So, you know, so what, what you basically described is how you know how you went through all the steps and growing your business and all the challenges along the way where do you think entrepreneurs go wrong you know I, I, I never viewed myself really as an entrepreneur um, really the way I've been seeing what I'm doing is just just I mean obviously there's the business side of it which is unfortunate you know that has to be a business side to it because it's you know it schleps everything down but um, Really, really, it's just been doing what I do. Um, if I would psychoanalyze um, entrepreneurs in general, I mean, I can't speak for, for businesses in general. I can speak in the music business. Um, I, and maybe it carries over. Yeah. Um, I think a mistake that a lot of us make in, in the Hasidic music, in the Jewish music market, a mistake that a lot of us make, and I believe it's a real mistake, is that we think that somebody else's success precludes my success. Mm -hmm. It means if somebody else is having a good run, it's at the expense of, of my good run. And if uh, somebody else puts out a hit record, that's bad for me because that's, that's going to compete with my numbers. And I think not only is it wrong, it's exactly the opposite of what's true. Mm -hmm. I think that the customers... For, for, the, for the general market, for the general Jewish music consumers, they don't know and they don't care who's who and who's what and who's where. They have a general feeling how they feel about Jewish music. Either they are positive about it or they are negative about it or they are um, apathetic. And one person putting out a, a good record will only add to people's positive associations with Jewish music, which in turn is good for all of us. Mm -hmm. If somebody puts out a bad record, all that does is gives negative associations with Jewish music, which is in turn bad for all of us. So to hope and wish and pray that my friend is not successful is like 
is like, uh, who, who said it to one of these great uh, Dalai Lama or somebody said, holding hatred in your heart is like drinking poison and hoping the other guy dies. Right, right, exactly. Right? It's where, where, where we are sinking our own ship, thinking that it's only, you know, only affecting other people. But it's not true. We are, we are one major business. We're one major family of Jewish musicians. And the way that the, the audience views it is that one thing. People, you don't usually hear people talk unless they're very much into it, unless they're like... The, they're, uh, they're in the business. The right. They're, they're, they, they cook in it. They love the... They'll go, this one and that one, and he's good and he's not so much. Most people will be like, I don't know, Jewish music has too many trumpets. You know what I mean? <laughs> they make general, general statements. Jewish music is so blah, blah, blah. Jewish music has a lot of, and they just, Jewish music is one clump in their, in their brain that is either good or not good. So it has to be our hope that all of those people in our business are putting out good music. So this way people can associate our genre with good music. And it probably carries over in, in, in every business, right? I mean, Absolutely. Um, if I'm in this massage chair business, and my friend makes a terrible massage chair and somebody sits in it and he goes, oh, massage chairs are horrible. That's terrible for me. It doesn't help me that my friend doesn't know how to make massage chairs because now I'll be able to get to business. It's terrible for me if now a, a, a guy who sat on a massage chair for the first time in his life thinks they're horrible. He's never going to look in look my direction. What you say is so true and it carries over to everything. Um, you know, I had a business coach who told me the following. He said, when you go out to talk to people, understand one thing. What you're selling is not your product or your service. What you're selling is you. And you don't have competition because you're unique. So there is no such thing as competition because you need to do you. And what someone else is doing is not you. So... So rather than competing with people, like you said, it's uh, one big happy family. We help each other. And, you know, I'm in the telecom industry. And it's really the same thing. If one guy does horribly, now telecom has a bad name. Oh, you're going to go buy your hosted phone service. Now don't buy it because it, it's horrible, bad quality. So it's, it's really the same thing in any industry that, that you're in. Um, you know, everybody should strive to do their best and to help others. And, you know, the truth is, uh, if you think about it, you know, this is what um, people in the motivational, uh, in the mindset uh, industry uh, love to talk about. And that is, you know, there's two, two, two ways of thinking. There's abundance and then there's lack. Um, if you have something, you share it. If, if you're not sharing, it's because you don't have it. So if you, if you, if you orient your mindset in the proper way that, you know, my success is, is not diminished by your success. Now, now you, you know, you have abundant success and now you don't mind helping everyone out. So now that was re re really nicely put the way you said that. Nice. Like it says that in the Baal Shem Tov Siddur, in the benching, it says, right? So in the, in the uh, Baal Shem Tov Siddur, it says, Instead of Akdesha, it says Hagedusha, the Gimel. Mm. Full, endless, endless quantity, right? Uh, I spoke to a guy, a very, very, very successful businessman, extremely successful up there, in the, maybe even in, in the 1%. And uh, he was at a bris, and I went over to him afterwards, and I gave him my Ashram Aleichem, and I said, May you be blessed. And he said to me, we are already blessed. Mm. And I said to him, don't limit, don't limit God. You have no idea. What he has given you thus far is peanuts compared to what he can give you. Yeah. Right? There's no limit. It's not like, right? It's not a zero-sum game on this world. The Abishter, the, the, the amount that he can give us is is from him, right? Is, 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 as, is as limited as he is, and he's not limited. Right. So the amount that he can give us is not limited. So someone else's success doesn't touch my success. 
right? Like that story that I heard from, from one of the uh, store owners here in Crown Heights 50 years ago, 60 years ago. There was a guy who had a fish store, an old man who had a fish store, a fish shop. Um, and he had it there for 20 years and he just plugged along. And uh, wouldn't you know it, up to block, a younger, sharper, fancier fish store opened up. And uh, somebody asked him, what are you going to do now? I'll look at that fish store. He was, he's going he's to take away all your... Uh, He's going to take away all your business. So the guy says, I'm not worried. It can't, uh, I'm not worried. The worst he can do is take my customers. He can't take my Parnosa. <laughs> because my Parnosa is my Parnosa. Like you said, I'm selling me, right? The Eberster has a certain amount that is cut out for me and nobody else can touch it. And being worried about it, is like the horse that kicks the water before he goes in for a drink because he sees the reflection. Another horse is coming in, <laughs> so he kicks it. Hello, you're not, you're not accomplishing anything. Nobody's coming after your portion. What you are going to get, you're going to get. You put in the work, you make the Kaylee, you, do, you work on the medits, and David does the, uh, the rest. And Adarab, uh, and Adarab, if you help people in your business, if you wish them success, honestly, and, uh, and, and you see it as, as, uh, as one big happy family, right? Like I feel bad for all those, for all those uh, honest used car salesmen, right? Mm-hmm. Because all the crooked ones give them a bad name. Nobody's like, well, this one is good, this one not. He's a used car salesman, he must be not trustworthy. Hello. Let's all just be honest for each other's sake. It's one big happy family. Um, hopefully happy. And, uh, and that's it. Beautiful. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that tonight, I mean, we started the interview this afternoon, but tonight after the Shkia, after the Tzitzah Kechavim, it became the Lubavitcher Rebbe's wedding anniversary when he married the previous Rebbe's daughter. And he said about today that this is the day that connected him to his chassidim. This is the day that connected, his exact question was, the day that connected you with me and me with you. So I just want to say I have a hot cup of water, but I could say l'chaim on water also. L'chaim. L'chaim. <laughs> we should have a lot of simchas and uh, good times. Amen. This is definitely a first, doing a l'chaim on water, on, 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 on camera. <laughs> yeah. Great. Benny, I know you're a busy guy, and we're going to let you go in just a minute. Um, before we wrap up, um, where can people go to get more of you? We're everywhere. We're on social media. Um, I haven't figured out Snapchat. From Somebody what I hear, that's, that's, that's going to be big. <laughs> yeah, well, anybody older than 25 who tells you that they understand Snapchat is lying. <laughs> I haven't figured it out. I, can't, I, I don't know how to get into it, but we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. And my website is bennysmusic.com. If that's too difficult to remember, you can put in bennyfriedman.com and it will direct you, redirect you to the website. Uh, we're on YouTube. We are on WhatsApp. WhatsApp also. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we're everywhere. Very and, good. And uh, I don't know. I mean, if you have some good ideas where we can expand to, I'm happy to hear it. Sure, sure. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. Um, are there any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, parting words of wisdom. No, I don't have any words of wisdom, <laughs> but I'll say something on the parsha, which ties in nicely to what we were talking about for the last uh, hour and a half. Yaakov, when he was afraid that uh, his brother Esau was going to harm him, prayed to Hashem and he finishes his prayer with the words, Ve'ata amarta, heitev eitev imach. You said, I will do good by you. Good, I will do good by you. So some people explained thusly. When you say, you meaning the person, not Hashem. When you say, when you say, don't worry, Hashem will, serve, will certainly help us. You say that it will be good. You believe in complete faith that everything will work out for the best because Hashem is in charge. I will do good by you. So if we live our lives with the positivity and the faith 
that Hashem runs the world and Hashem runs it right and Hashem runs it well and Hashem runs it good and nice and uh, all his decisions are ultimately the best decisions and he's got it under control. When we live our lives like that, a good by you. That's a promise that Hashem makes. So again, this will be the second time. L'chaim, here's to a good life, here's to happiness, nachas from our children, and, uh, and to just spending our lives spreading positive influence to uh, everyone who we come in contact with. L'chaim. L'chaim, L'chaim. That's beautiful, Benny. Benny, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, all the time you spent and making the time for us. And I know we had uh, a couple of breaks in the middle and it was... Did you, did you catch uh, the footage of the police officers? I did. <laughs> that was recorded. I would love to get it. I would love to, you know, <laughs> try to explain to my kid's school why I came late to pick him up. <laughs> I'll send that over to you. All right. Take care. Okay. All right, one second, one second. Yep. Don't go. You need to do a selfie. Ah, yes. We'll keep it up. <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Here we go. One, two. And then we need to do... This is how we make a living, but stay <laughs> Here, we'll do... Uh, we'll get the camera out. We got our interviews going. Abram, say hello. Hello. Hello, Instagram. This is it. It's a new world. <laughs>